when, uh, when the studies were done in terms of uh, getting cattle taken off to uh, market in order to get them from uh, the herd and into the slaughterhouse, it was noticed how often the animals became stressed and it was a very difficult process by prodding the animals out of the tractor trailer and onto the ramps and into the slaughterhouse that they would obviously resist. And as a result of that, after scientists had looked at various ways to, to protect and calm and keep the animals, they began a, a method of getting the animals off the tractor trailers in silence without prodding them with electric prods, but silently moving them down the ramps, herding them into, um, into uh, these uh, shoots, these squeeze shoots. And uh, Joel Robson was so kind to mention to me this morning that these squeeze shoots, they would guide the animals, one, so that they couldn't turn around, and two, so that they, they couldn't look back. And so as the animals were being gently nudged in, scientists had found that as the animals were gently squeezed on their sides, it gave them the sense of comfort and sense of security so that as they're on their way to slaughter, that, that they have the sense of that nurturing motherly sense of, uh, of the herd being around them. And so they would come to that place where they would just be lifted up onto a conveyor ramp which would suddenly lead them to that moment where, bang, they would be killed. And without even any panic or notice or, or sense of being overwhelmed, the animal would just silently be led from livestock to meat. There's so many things here that are quite interesting in terms of how, how this works, this idea of how we can be led very much into our own death trap, if you would, James talks about in James 1 how that temptation comes along and when it gives birth to sin, sin then when it's full grown will produce death, James says in James 1. And the devil has a way of tempting us. He's studied us as human beings for millennia. He knows the patterns of how human beings work. And because he knows the patterns of how human beings work, he's refined his techniques to, to lead us and guide us so as to subtly lead us to the place of temptation which can give birth to sin, which can then lead, when it's full grown, to death. And that sense of of temptation that leads to death is an erosion of our sense of danger around us, that there is this subtlety that sin does, that temptation brings to dull our senses. And so when we come to Matthew chapter 4, I want us to consider this morning then as Jesus faces a testing and temptation in the wilderness, how do we resist temptation? Jesus goes into the wilderness and he himself is tempted by the devil, we are told, yet he does not sin. And so what I want us to look at this morning are three ways, three things that can help us in our worship of the Lord Jesus Christ as we fa face temptation. And there are three things that maybe you won't immediately connect with this passage, but I want to drive it out in terms of its broader context from Deuteronomy. And so three things to help us worship the glorious Christ. And the first is that we need to overcome and face temptation by loving God with all of our heart. We're told in verse 1 of chapter 4 that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He has just come out of his baptism, Matthew tells us in chapter and he's being now led into the wilderness by the Spirit of God. The Spirit is, Mark uses more forceful language of being, being driven out into the wilderness where he now faces this moment of, well, testing and temptation. That word to tempt can also be translated as to, to test. And there is a distinct difference because when we come to this word, we need to understand that God does not tempt us, that God will test us, and so there is a testing that Christ undergoes, but God never tempts us. It is the work of the devil to tempt us, but it is the work of God to test us. Now, what, what's the difference? In, in testing, what God is doing is 
He is revealing to us what we know about ourselves, what's in our hearts, and what's going on with the intention that we would grow in Christ-likeness and that we would become like Him. God never tests us to cause us to fail. God tests us in order to refine us for His glory and for His good. But the devil, the devil tempts us Because it is the devil's aim not to see us succeed in obedience, but to fall. And so the difference between God's testing is that testing is leading towards our growth in Christ and success, whereas the devil's tempting is to lead us to our downfall. And here, Jesus goes into the wilderness, we're told, where he is going to be tempted by the devil. This is this satanic work of seeking to see Jesus fail where he needs to succeed. And, and the way that, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> the way that, that Mark plays this out is it's quite something in verse 2. And after fasting 40 days <clears throat> and 40 nights, we're told he was hungry. Now, that's quite the understatement, isn't it? You haven't eaten for 40 days and nights, and you are hungry. There's this deep sense of hunger. And as Jesus is hungry, the tempter, the devil himself, Jesus will call him Satan later on, the accuser who comes just as he came to Adam in the garden, he comes and he comes to Jesus and says in verse 3, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And with each temptation that Jesus has, Jesus will quote from either Deuteronomy 6 or Deuteronomy 8. And as as Moses was preparing Israel to go into the promised land in Deuteronomy, he was giving these speeches to them about the testing and temptations that they had faced in the wilderness. And so Jesus goes back to this wilderness moment that Israel had as they were about to go into the promised land, and he reiterates the very words that Moses had said. Israel, you see, had been tested in the wilderness as God's son. God had called Israel his firstborn son in Exodus 4, verse 22, and out in the wilderness as the firstborn son, Israel had faced testing and temptation. In the first instance, As Jesus responds to Satan, turn these stones into loaves of bread, Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 8. And in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses had given the people these words. He he had said to the people that they were to remember the commandments that God had given to them. That they were to recall them to mind so that they would live and multiply and flourish in the promised land. And in verse 2 of of Deuteronomy 8, it says, And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And because God had tested Israel, when they had come through the Red Sea in Exodus uh, 13 through 15, when they had passed through the waters of judgment as their moment of baptism, as they had come to the other side and God had defeated the Egyptians by having the Red Sea close in over the Egyptians. And now as Israel wandered out into the wilderness, they began to complain, we're told in Exodus 16. And they grumbled and complained against Moses and Aaron and their leadership that at least in Egypt they had meat and, and, and leeks to eat, whereas now in the wilderness, had Moses and Aaron brought them out there to die? And Moses' response was, your complaint is not against Aaron and me, it is against the Lord. And as a result of that, Moses reminded the people in Deuteronomy 8 of this scenario and said that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It was a testing to see what was in your heart. Because as Moses says, He humbled you and led, let you hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that He might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And what God was doing in the wilderness, He was testing Israel, not because He lacked knowledge of them, but because they needed a knowledge of themselves. What was in their heart? What was in them? 
And that they would, would they depend upon bread alone for their survival? At the very moment where Israel was out in the wilderness, they were questioning whether God was withholding from them. Just like Adam had been doubting God in the garden, had God really provided what was needed when he was told he could not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So Israel now was faced with this moment in Exodus 16 of questioning, had God brought them out to the wilderness to, to bring them to their death? Had God withheld his goodness from them? Now Satan tempts Jesus by saying, take these stones, turn them into bread, satisfy your hunger, your deep, abiding hunger that is there. To which Jesus says, no, God isn't withholding from me because what sustains me is not merely bread alone, this bread that God had sent from heaven, this manna, as we saw in the children's ministry video this morning, but what sustained him was every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. That we have to fight temptation by realizing the desires of our own heart. Do we think that God is withholding from us? That He lacks goodness? That He is not there for us? This is where temptation often begins. It begins with when our desires are not met. And so we must love God with all of our heart, that our desires, our heart's longings would be shaped by a love for God, that no matter what comes our way, whether good or difficulty, that we would love God, that it is a resolve that we choose, that we make to love God with our whole being. But not only do we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, but we love the Lord our God, second of all, with all of our soul. The second temptation that comes is the devil took Jesus, we're told in verse 5 of Matthew 4, to the holy city of Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, and he quotes from uh, Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And in the context as the devil quotes the very scriptures to Jesus and says to him, you could throw yourself off of this place. Most likely it was at the very top pinnacle piece of the temple where it not only went down to its foundations but would have had the valley below. It would have been a tremendous fall. It would have been a tempting moment to call Jesus to, to plunge himself down because if he had been rescued by angels, the word would spread of his great salvation and rescue and would certainly bring fame to him. But Psalm 91 is in the context of God being our refuge and our strength. That he who abides in the shelter of the Almighty will, will hide himself under his wings and say, the Lord is my refuge. It's to find refuge in God. And in fact, as, as, as the one who would find refuge in God would know, Psalm 91 would point out this. And Jesus knows this himself because not only is God your refuge, but when God is your refuge, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And it proceeds in verse 13 with, you will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. It is not by seeking out your own good and by seeking, being reckless that throws yourself in harm's way, that you find that God is your refuge and your strength. But it is depending upon God by not giving in to temptation in the very moment. Because when we find God is our refuge and your strength, then you will trample the serpent underfoot. The serpent that had come into the garden to tempt Adam and Eve, which Adam should have just put his foot down and stomped that serpent. So the psalmist says here that the one who finds refuge in the Lord is the one who will put the serpent and trample him underfoot. And so Jesus knows that it's not about throwing yourself in harm's way, that you do not find that, that you resist temptation by, by being reckless. This is testing God. And Jesus responds to the devil by saying, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And here he quotes Deuteronomy 6, 16. 
And when Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6.16, he is quoting Moses when Moses is reminding Israel, you put God to the test when you were out in the wilderness and there was no water and you were accusing him. You put God to the test. Don't put God to the test, Moses says in Deuteronomy 6.16, as you did at the waters of Meribah or at Massa. Don't do it. That you are testing God to question his goodness. As though that what was lacking for you was you were lacking in strength and resolve. That you were more concerned about your own life. And that by being more concerned about your own life, you were loving yourself with all of your life. But what you are called to do is to love God that when he takes you into those hard places, when he takes you into the place where it looks like death, that you trust Him and love Him and believe in Him and not throw yourself into reckless ways. You see, so many people, they, they get into a situation where they live recklessly, they fall into temptation, and they go, Why, God? Why would you do that to me? As though God is to, to be at fault. This is what Israel was doing in the wilderness. As though God was to blame for their lack of provision without trusting Him, without depending upon Him. Israel had lacked water in Exodus 17. And to have God is to, have, to love Him with all of your soul. It's not to test Him, but to trust Him. That in your life and in your death, God is always good. He is not like a shifting shadow, as James 1.17 says. But He is always good. That He brings every good and every perfect gift, which is from above. And so we love God with all of our soul as we depend upon Him in life and in death. Not by being reckless, not throwing ourselves in temptation's way, but by resisting temptation and finding that God is our refuge and our strength. So as we love God with all of our heart, our desires being aligned with His, as we love God with all of our soul, loving Him with our lives, not living recklessly, but living for Him. The third thing then we see is that we love the Lord our God with all of our strength. Jesus then is brought by the devil to, the, to this great high mountain, and He has showed all of the kingdoms of the world in all their glory, we're told, in Matthew 4, verse 8. And the devil said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And here it is so abundantly plain that the politics are offered to Jesus without any cost, without any cross. That he could have all the kingdoms of the world without, without requiring any sacrifice of his own. And this is always the temptation of politics, the temptation to, to power, to might, to greatness. It's the temptation that we, that we have is that we want to trust in political means to accomplish only what God can do by spiritual means. And in trusting God, Jesus understands that the very first thing that he must do is worship the Lord his God alone. And he quotes Deuteronomy 6, 13. And in that context, Moses is reminding Israel of how he was up on the mountain. He had received the Ten Commandments. He had come down. They were worshiping the golden calf, and he had brought the rebuke to them, saying, you are to worship and serve the Lord your God alone, lest his anger be kindled against you. That there is no other way to worship God than to worship him alone. This is why Deuteronomy 6 Verses 4 and 5, it begins with the great confession that Israel would repeat on, on regular, a regular basis. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And this is the great commandment that Israel had been given, to love God and to worship Him alone with all of their being. And that this was the reminder in Israel's confession that the resisting of temptation and the fighting in the face of a test was to love God. It was a call to a higher worship. It's a resisting of the political powers of the day. That some will trust in chariots and some will trust in truck convoys, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. 
That's what we put our trust in. We don't put our trust for freedom in some political mechanism or party or protest. We put our trust in God alone. And when we put our trust in God alone, it's not putting our hope in a political means. It is putting our hope that God is the one who is our refuge and strength, our very present help in every time of trouble. And we resist the temptation to align align ourselves to an, an idolatry of political mechanisms, which so often happens in North American life, that we love to put our trust in politics, But Jesus says, be gone from me, Satan. We'll worship God alone. And the reason we are to grow in our worship, to resist temptation by loving God with our heart and our soul and our strength, is that all of this is intended to grow in us a worship that enables us to worship the glorious Christ. This is what fuels us in the resistance of temptation. It is not merely saying no to temptation, but it is primarily saying yes to Christ. And as we worship the glorious Christ, Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy 6 and 8 over and over in this section. And he does so because he is functioning in a way that Matthew makes it very evident throughout the beginning of his gospel that Jesus is the true Israel. He is the true Israelite who comes where Israel was tempted in the wilderness and failed when they failed with bread and they grumbled against God and grumbling being this great reflection of our hearts that there is sin, that there is something severely wrong when we're grumbling. Jesus faces the test in the wilderness and he does not grumble. But he passes the test. That where Israel failed the test with bread and with water and with the golden calf, Jesus goes into the wilderness. We're told in verse 1 that he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he passes the test. That Israel was there for 40 years so that they would see what's in their hearts. But Jesus is there for 40 days and he passes the test because he is the true Israelite who is faithful, the true Son of God. That where Israel failed as the Son of God, Jesus succeeds. In Luke's Gospel, in Luke chapter 4, what's very fascinating is that Luke compares Jesus to Adam. Adam, who was in the garden, who was given the test by the serpent coming in, and Adam failed. And we know that Luke has this idea uh, of Jesus being greater than Adam because at the end of chapter 3, after a long list of the genealogy uh, that leads from Christ, all the way down it ends with, and Adam was the son of God. And then this chapter begins in Luke where Jesus is seen to be the true and better Adam who does not fail where Adam failed in the garden. You see, it is in Jesus who is the true son who reveals his glory. This is why, I think, in the first two temptations, how does the devil begin the temptation? If you are the Son of God. It's a calling into question Jesus' own identity, which is what happened with Adam. It is what happened with Israel, that they forgot their true identity as the sons of God. But Jesus does not forget in that moment that he is the true son. He remembers that he is the true son. Jesus repeats Israel's history, and he resists and overcomes temptation. Now, how does he come overcome temptation? I've heard this passage preached a number of times, and almost inevitably, I've heard something go like this. The way that Jesus overcame the devil was by quoting Scripture. So you should too. Probably heard that, right? And how many times have you quoted Scripture and then you've fallen? It's happened, right? But I quoted a Bible verse, Jesus. I have been told to, to be like Jesus. And he quoted a Bible verse and he resisted temptation and the devil fled from him. But here I am. I quoted a Bible verse. And temptation didn't go away. It actually got stronger. And I fell into sin. What's wrong with your word, God? Now, that's being very explicit in terms of how we actually think. 
We, we have this idea that if we quote a Bible verse like it's some sort of magical incantation, that the temptation will just dissipate and go away. I quoted the Bible verse and poof, look at that. Magically, there was no more temptation. Is that what Jesus does? Is that how it works? Is that what we're supposed to do? Quote a Bible verse and then temptation will flee from us? Well, it's, I'm not saying don't quote a Bible verse, but understand what Jesus does when he quotes the scriptures. Because it is not by having some magical incantation of a quotation of a scripture that causes temptation to flee, but rather what sustains Jesus in the wilderness and what sustains him in the moment of temptation is the word that was spoken over him at his baptism at the end of Matthew 3. As the heavens are torn open and the Spirit of God descends upon him like a dove and he goes out into the wilderness, the final words that Matthew records for us at Jesus' baptism is the voice of the Father saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. His identity is rooted in the very Word of God. His identity as the Son of God is rooted in the Word of God. So that when the tempter comes and he calls into question his sonship, if you're the Son of God, Jesus is grounded in his sonship by the Word of the Father. That it's the Word of God that has sustained him by reminding him of who he is as the true Son of God. So Jesus isn't just quoting verses thinking that temptation will flee. He is quoting scriptures that remind him of his very own identity and the word of the Father being confirmed. This is why Stanley Hauerwas, I think so wonderfully in his commentary on Matthew, he says, what sustained Jesus in the wilderness was the benediction of the Father at his baptism. This is my Son whom I love. In him I am well pleased. That's what sustains us. It's the remembering and recalling of Scripture of how God sees us. That we are the sons of God. And by recalling these things to mind, it's not a mere recanting of, or a recalling of Scripture so as to think it does some sort of magical function, but rather to recall to us, as Moses says to, to Israel, remember, 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 remembering who we are as the sons of God, that God has spoken a good word. He withholds nothing good from his children so that when we face temptation, the resistance comes by knowing that God dearly loves us. That this trial and this test is not a lack of God's love, but it is a reminder that we must put ourselves as people who are in the refuge of the Lord and in of his love. And so Jesus hears this word, and this is the first thing that we need to face temptation. It's a greater worship. It's a greater worship by grounding us in the love that God has for us in Jesus. But the second thing is, back in verse 1 and 2, Jesus is driven out into the wilderness. And we're told in verse 2 that he was there 40 days and 40 nights. Now, why not just say he was there 40 days? Because that implies 40, 40 nights as well. Why this recitation of 40 days and 40 nights? The authors of Scripture mention things very deliberately. And they do so in a way to recall things to our minds. And what we find is that when Moses was out in the wilderness with the people of Israel, in Exodus 24, verse 18, he was, we are told that he had gone up the mountain that first time to receive the Ten Commandments from God, and he had fasted 40, and he had no water 40 days and 40 nights. And when he had come down from the mountain and Israel was worshiping the golden calf, as they were worshiping the golden calf, he smashed the stones to bits and he went back up the mountain after pleading for Israel and he fasted and he prayed for Israel and for Aaron and for their salvation for 40 days and 40 nights, Exodus, uh, Exodus 34, 28 says. And as Moses recounts the golden calf incident in Deuteronomy chapter 9, Moses says, in Deuteronomy 9, verse 9, when I went up the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, 
the tablets of covenant that the Lord made with you, I remained on the mountain forty days and forty nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water, and the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were all the words that the Lord had spoken with you on the mountain out of the midst of the fire and on the day of the great assembly. And at the end of forty days and forty nights, the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant. And Moses then recalls how he came down from the mountain. And when he came down from the mountain, there he saw and he heard the people worshiping the golden calf. And so he says in Deuteronomy 9, 15, So I turned and came down from the mountain, and the mountain was burning with fire, and the two tablets of the covenant were in my two hands. And I looked, and behold, you had sinned against the Lord your God. You had made yourselves a golden calf. You had turned aside quickly from the way that the Lord had commanded you. So I took the hold of the two tablets threw them out of my two hands and broke them before your eyes. Then I lay prostrate before the Lord as before forty days and forty nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water because all the sin that you had committed in doing what was evil in the eyes of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And this is the key here in Deuteronomy 9, 19 and 20. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure that the Lord bore against you so that he was ready to destroy you but the Lord listened to me that time also. And the Lord was so angry with Aaron that he was ready to destroy him. And I prayed for Aaron also at the same time. And it seems to me that the 40 days and 40 nights is not just Jesus recapitulating what Israel did for 40 years in the wilderness. But it is a reminder that he is not just the true Israelite, the true son of God, the true and better Israel, but he is also the true and better Moses. That when Israel fell into temptation and sin, Moses prayed for them for 40 days and 40 nights fasting in the wilderness. And when we face temptation... Not only do we recall the scriptures that remind us of our true identity as children loved by God, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, but we recall that Jesus was out in the wilderness facing temptation, praying for us, interceding on our behalf. Would it help you to know in the moment of great trial and temptation, that when you feel most alone, that you're not alone? Would it help you to know that there is a voice that is praying for you in that moment? The voice of Jesus, who is speaking to his Father and pleading on your behalf, Father, do not let them be snatched by the devil and into his hands, but deliver them from evil. It's this reason when we pray the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is not just telling us how to pray, he is praying with us. He says, Our Father, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For he prays, with us and for us. And by praying with us and for us, it is not just Jesus who is facing temptation in the wilderness, but it is Jesus who is overcoming temptation and resisting the devil who prays for your deliverance and mine. It is not God tempting you so that you would be reckless and fall into sin. But it is God testing to show you what's in your heart so that you would worship him more. For this reason, Paul would say, no temptation has seized you except that which is common to man. And the Lord himself will give you a way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And the way of escape is that he reminds you of your sonship, that you belong to the Father. 
And He gives you Jesus Himself who prays with you and for you. And He gives you His Spirit who leads you out in the wilderness and goes with you. And He Himself, the Lord Jesus, faces temptation, overcomes it here and at the cross ultimately. But here, the beginning of the defeat of Satan so that you would know that you can trust this very word, that it is your life and your breath. You see, it's not a few more Bible verses that are going to help you, but it's a stronger worship when you know what God thinks of you, when your sins are forgiven. It is the love of God because there is one who fought for you. There is one who faced temptation for you. There is one who overcame the devil for you. There is one who now prays for you, not so that you would be tempted and fall, but that you would be tested and you would succeed because our God is for us and he is not against us.